So we're doing a second panel now, and we're going to start with Karen Newman. Um, Karen Newman is a research fellow here in Digital Media at Coventry University, um, where she's developing a pioneering new center for applied research and collaborative practice, Birmingham Open Media. So BOM will bring together artists, computer scientists, and researchers to produce new commissioned artworks and online interventions exploring the impacts of emerging technologies on society and hacktivist culture. Newman's previous curatorial research outputs include award-winning commissioned projects with some of the most influential and exciting artists. She was curator at FACT, the UK's leading centre for art and technology between 2005 and 2010, where she contributed to Liverpool's flagship Capital of Culture programme and commissioned Apishapong Virat's Hakul's critically acclaimed multi-platform artwork, Primitive, which toured internationally and resulted in the Palme d'Or winning feature film at Cannes Film Festival in 2010. Hello. Right, well, just to start off by giving a bit, bit more background, um, really, because I don't... Um, I don't think I really uh, fit in uh, neatly to the kind of scholarly academic box, or at least I uh, felt like I didn't before I started this research fellowship. But, um, you know, if there's anywhere that I, I would um, uh, go and work in an academic setting, I guess it would be the Centre for Disruptive Media because that is, um, it really synergises uh, or synthesises with a lot of um, the things that I'm interested in. So my previous curatorial um, research interests have been around the uh, relationships between vision and memory and media. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been a curator for about 10 years. And then over the last year or so, I've, um, I've actually been uh, actively researching new uh, creative business models um, within the arts um, and thinking about um, kind of new creative and economic spaces as a result, uh, or that could um, respond to opportunities in the contemporary uh, creative and economic climate. So it's really interesting to be uh, presenting today and um, aligning what I'm doing with, with some of the other kind of progressive business models um, that, that are being looked at. So. Um, well, also just to kind of go back to basics a little bit, um, just for anyone that's still unclear, that, uh, just to give a bit of clarity on, over the term disruptive media, because it's something that we, we tend to kind of refer to between ourselves quite a lot in the Centre for Disruptive Media. Um, so disruptive media, according to Clayton Christensen, who's a professor in business administration at the Harvard Business School, is something that facilitates the production of a new market and a new network of values and eventually succeeds in disrupting an already established market and value network, typically enabling new markets to emerge. So this image is a good case in point. The mobile phone um, with its built-in camera uh, superseded um, video cameras and, uh, and other kind of phones and, um, and has kind of, uh, you know, has a, had a dramatic effect on um, the still and moving image uh, camera markets as well. Just gonna move on a bit. Um, and this is another great example of an artist's impression, I guess, of a, of a kind of disruptive media. This is a Japanese artist called Onkawara, uh, who made a piece of um, a series of works in 1971 called I Am Still Alive. Um, and at this point, uh, the uh, telegram was a, a dying technology. It, was, it had been kind of fast replaced by uh, fax technology and other faster forms of communication. Uh, and he was playing on the, um, the kind of gap um, and the, you know, the, the evolution of uh, the quick kind of evolution of technologies and, and what had been replaced in quite a short amount of time uh, by referring to his own uh, mortality. And so he would send a series of telegrams to his friends and colleagues around the world saying simply, I'm still alive. Um, and you know, it would take a day or two for the telegram to arrive. So the person would receive the telegram, quite unusual to receive a telegram in, in those days still, um, and think, oh, on, on, he's still alive. But actually, that was two days ago, so maybe there's something wrong. And so it's kind of playing on that, um, the, the idea of time and the, um, the, the, you know, the succession of technology quite quickly. I really like that example. Um, and all too often, I think, as researchers of disruptive media, I think we, we tend to refer to 
disruptive technologies in quite globalised terms. We refer to, um, you know, the, the birth of the camera phone market and what that what that meant for the other kind of uh, digital um, and analogue uh, film markets, uh, and the effects of e-publishing, for example, and the um, implications that. Um, that kind of development has had on other kinds of scholarly publishing and other kinds of publishing. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity uh, here in the West Midlands to actually kind of look um, even more local and to, to actually begin to kind of think about some of the histories and local contexts here in the West Midlands that um, are actually really strong and really interesting for thinking about um, new business models for a different creative economy. Um, so going back even further in time, <clears throat> I think one of the most disruptive innovations of all time, possibly, is um, Matthew Bolton and James Watt's steam engine. So this was uh, developed through the 1700s, and um, it was largely responsible for the Industrial Revolution. Um, it was a kind of key feature of uh, transferring labour from humans to machines, and it was uh, developed in Birmingham. Um, uh, as a technology and exported in, in um, steam engines across the world. Um, so it had a, a massive effect, uh, not least on the West Midlands itself, which um, kind of suffered as a, as a result of its um, troublesome technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a city, as a, as a region that was known around the world as workshop of the world and city of a thousand trades in Birmingham, that, that kind of industrial uh, development had a massive impact. Birmingham also played a really key role in the evolution of photographic media. So um, lots of uh, technologies were developed and ideas were developed, including silver plating. Silver plating um, was used as a fundamental part of the camera. Silver plates that were um, you know, built into cameras and shipped across the world. Um, and so that, that was a kind of key uh, process in the evolution of photographic media. And also uh, Alexandra Parks invented um, celluloid. As, as the first uh, 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 first kind of moldable plastic, so that had its own amplifications and you know massively um, contributed towards the development of the still and moving image, as we know it, and mass exhibition, um, as well as contributing to other kinds of mass consumerisms as well. In fact, by the year two thousand, four thousand um, inventions copyrighted in the UK. Uh, 2,800 of those came from within a 35-mile radius of Birmingham. Peter Colgate of the uh, uh, Patent Office stated that every year Birmingham amazes us by coming up with thousands of inventions. It's impossible to explain, but the people in this area seem to have a remarkable ability to come up with and have the dedication to produce ideas. That's just a few examples of the many things that we've produced including um, Coventry's um, production of the first ever British car, um, Daimler's first ever British car, which was manufactured here in Coventry in 1897. And the regions con continue to play a leading role in manufacturing and industry. Um, more recently, it's just been announced uh, in the last few weeks, I think, that the, uh, there's a new £40 million National Aerospace Technology Programme that's been announced for Coventry, while Google uh, still uh, ca continue their work on trying to uh, find a solution for a driverless car, and that offers further disruptions yet to come. Um, so Walter Benjamin's 1936 essay, again, kind of leaping back in time, but it's a, a, a kind of key text to kind of rethink um, where we are here in the West Midlands and, and what, um, uh, what mechanical reproduction means today and for the region. His essay, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reprodu Reproduction, explores uh, the effects of uh, visual reproduction and the new possibilities afforded through photography and film for mass exhibition. So it was kind of... Um, you know, quite a few years in, actually, to, to film and photographic practice as a whole and kind of thinking through what implications that um, those disruptive media had had on the way that we think about art, um, the way that we think <coughs> about uh, the original um, and the way that we think about a, a cult kind of status associated with art. He describes the transformation that pro photographic media had um, on perceptions, authoring and transcending art's cult status. Benjamin's theory derives from Marx's philosophy, whereby modes of production form the basis for other social phenomena, including social relations and political systems, connecting ideas around class systems. 
and Marxism has gained new popularity in recent years, um, connecting ideas around class systems and thinking about con contemporary capital capitalism in the wake of a global economic price crisis. Uh, references can be seen in artistic programmes um, across culture, cultural spheres um, over recent years, including exhibitions, festivals and publishing in the UK, particularly since 2012. The image at the bottom is, um, is an image from Liverpool Biennial in, in 2010, which featured a Marxist lounge with all of the kind of literature um, by Karl Marx and associated with Marxism. Urban studies theorist Richard Florida has talked about how the economic crisis currently has actually boosted innovation in his book, The Great Reset. He says these periods of crises and recovery are periods of the most rapid innovation in capitalism. And he goes on to say, um, when thinking about um, the, 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 the economic crash and what would happen, I made the counter proposition that in fact, not only would cities like New York and London not fail as a result of the financial crash, but as of 2008, I said they would emerge stronger. And the shift change that, um, that Florida is referring to also involves a cull of broadly middle class jobs, which has a particular resonance for the wave of creative destruction, as we're currently witnessing it um, in relation to high culture. Creative destruction is a term also used by Karl Marx to, um, to, to think about capitalist development and how that results um, as a uh, how that um, uh, occurs as a result of creative destruction of the previous economic system and um, so here you can see that actually um, GVA so gross value added um, the products produced by a country um, actually increased um, between um, around 2008-2009 and it's continued to increase um, so the creative industries have actually been very good at responding to opportunities for innovation despite um, other kind of silos of activity such as um, museums, galleries and libraries which have actually suffered um, as a result of public funding cuts um, they've actually decreased their performances and productions and employability um, so it seems that maybe those kinds of uh, creative industries haven't been able to respond um, as quickly or effectively to some of the opportunities that the crisis um, has caused. So um, I kind of think about those in terms of the superstructures, um, the contemporary art superstructures that have evolved, particularly through the 20th century, um, and uh, the GVA of the creative industry has increased by 15.6% since 2008, compared with an increase of 5.4% for the rest of the UK economy. That's quite staggering, actually, that the creative industries had a much higher um, increase overall than the, the, crea than the uh, UK economy. And I think that's a really different um, picture to what a lot of contemporary art, publicly funded spaces would, would paint um, those, the kind of contemporary art superstructure that was formed and evolved through the 20th century, uh, which is predominantly 90% um, public funded by um, uh, places like the Arts Council. In the 2013 <coughs> report, rebalance, Rebalancing the Creative Capital, um, the, um, a report by Peter Stark, Christopher Gordon and David Powell lobbied for the continued growth of clusters of internationally innovative and competitive cultural and creative production, contributing to sustainable regional and economic growth. And the development of new models for sustainable provisions of high quality facilities and programmes for participation in and enjoyment of the arts, contributing to well-being in individuals and communities. That's a report that more heavily talks about uh, or argues for a more equal distribution of funding between London and the region, which is, you know, an incredibly um, strong point which needs to be made. Um, but there are little glimpses in that that are also kind of relevant to um, to thinking about, you know, what kind of new models, uh, this is the most important thing from my point of view, what kind of new models of cultural production do we need to adopt um, in today's creative and economic climate to move forward and to, to kind of capture the, the rise in creative industries and, and economy that, that other, other um, initiatives have been able to, to to respond to. So I think within the last eight years particularly, and this is something that's formed a kind of key part of my um, research when thinking about new, new business models um, for the arts, um, has been the maker movement, which has enjoyed a burgeoning scene with hacker spaces and fab labs um, designed for DIY, cross-innovation and learning through doing. 
These spaces offer a range of tools from electronics, robotics, 3D printing, CNC tools, woodworking, metalworking, arts and crafts, a whole variety of things um, round the clock, um, open access to members um, and cross innovation work. So, so opportunities to kind of learn through peer to peer production um, and, and different, different ways of learning. And more recently, um, some joined up initiatives in London around the uh, London uh, Bridge <coughs> Business Improvement District have been looking at cities such as Barcelona with thriving maker cultures to see how they could import that, that kind of cultural activity um, into a place like London and to see what it could potentially do for cultural regeneration. And I've got a note to myself here, um, which was uh, Craig was talking about how, you know, it's a kind of interesting connection to folklore, actually, and thinking about folklore right now. And I think that's, it's a really interesting connection to make here today, is thinking about, as I have been, um, actually, how can you um, respond to a subculture to kind of remodel the, the culture at large? And, and, and I think there's an opportunity there. Simultaneously, the rising cost of higher education and student debt has seen the rapid spread of open education or endeavours to, to provide open access to educational engagement and experience and open educational resources of which the Centre for Disruptive Media has been a particularly active player. The Centre's media department was the first practical media department in the country to start broadcasting lectures to the iTunes U platform and to the YouTube Edu, pla Edu platform in 2009, following a boom in massive open online courses, or MOOCs, as they're also called. And the media department's innovated in teaching and learning through open technologies and pedagogies, including the development of the world's first open iPhone application for a photography degree course, as well as various other projects in open education and photography and creative activism. Living Look Books About Life um, <clears throat> is a great example of um, one of the university's, um, one of the center's experiments in, in open access. Um, this is uh, a, a Edited a series edited by Claire Birchall, Gary Hall, and Joanna Zalinski. Zalinska. That's a series of curated open access books about life, with life understood both philosophically and bio biologically, which provide a bridge between the humanities and the sciences. And it's produced by a globally distributed um, network of writers and editors. Uh, it repackages uh, existing open source access science research by clustering it around selected topics and um, selected themes whose unifying theme is life. Um, so air, aquaculture, bioethics, cosmetics, electronic waste, energy, numerology, pharmacology. So anyone can add to this. You can remix it. You can download it. Um, you can contact the authors and, uh, and contribute a book towards it if you, if you so wish. Since 2012, the Wellcome Trust um, has also adopted a policy whereby all of the research it supports has to be made available in an online open access publication or repository as a condition of all of its funding that it gives out. And the new availability of open data, um, information that's available for anyone to use for any purpose at no cost, has provided greater transparency between the government's collection of data and public understanding with initiatives such as www.data.gov and data.gov.uk designed to promote innovation that encourage the use and reuse of government data sets. Um, and the Open Data Institute was also established in 2012 by Professor Nigel Shadbolt and Sir Tim Berners-Lee, catalyzing the evolution of open data culture to create economic, environmental and social value. Um, and they do a whole range of stuff. Um, they just commissioned some uh, artworks by various different creative practitioners, including Ellie Harrison, who made this great piece called Vending Machine, uh, which sat in the offices of the a Open Data Institute and uh, was hooked up to um, various different news streams online. So whenever there was news of a financial crisis, the vending machine would automatically empty its whole content, so it would give free food. So a really nice piece of work. <laughs> Okay, and one of the centre's latest experiments is a new model of applied research for art and technology called BOM, or Birmingham Open Media. Birmingham Open Media responds to the substantial developments in digital culture that phenomenon like open access, open data, and open source offer. 
BOM seeks to explore new creative practices and debates relating to open media and our everyday interaction with technologies. BOM's the major output of my research fellowship in digital media within the centre, which began in August. Uh, and I'm already feeling the pressure to deliver the output before the end of my research fellowship in August. Um, so our new commissions will bring together, as Yannicka said, uh, artists, technologists and researchers to collaborate on cross-innovation artworks using interactive technologies um, and interventions in the public realm. That includes interventions across the internet, uh, exploring things like steganography, which is the process of concealing secret information in image files, as was used by the terrorists who organised 9-11. BOM sits within an emerging practice of art and technology centres, such as iShed in Bristol, Culture Lab and Mixed Reality Lab, uh, Culture Lab in uh, Newcastle and Mixed Reality Lab in Nottingham. Um, and these kind of new spaces offer uh, different uh, ways for producing uh, cultural content and audience engagement, typically bringing together creative practitioners such as artists with researchers and technologists to develop cross-innovation collaborative projects which eventually find their way to public audiences. Research is central to these new spaces, and this is something that I looked at a lot in my research, and like what, what kind of new program do artists need um, to innovate and create um, going forward, and what kind of uh, programs do audiences need to engage with that um, have currency that, that, and, and urgency. Um, so I shared, for example, partners with the University of the West of England and Bristol University, Mixed Reality Lab is based at Nottingham University and Culture Lab is based at Newcastle University. And these collaborations allow for the spaces, such as iShed and Culture Lab and Mixed Reality Lab, um, they offer those organisations um, free access to specialist academic and technical knowledge. And for the higher education institution, they offer valuable research outputs with critical recognition exterior to the academic environment, which can be used um, for submission to, for example, the Research Excellence Framework, or REF, to attract future research funding and develop the prestige of the institution. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is also a kind of, a, it's a nice way of kind of moving forward and working and um, uh, a, a kind of move away from the way that I've previously worked with researchers and research-based practices. Um, so this was a project um, kind of tagged onto an exhibition uh, which are curated at FACT, Foundation for Art and Creative Technology in Liverpool. We did an exhibition called Persistence of Vision, which looked at the interplay of vision memory media. Um, and we, as part of that process, I wanted to work with um, vision experts and memory studies experts and neuroscientists and kind of pull together different ways of thinking. I guess I'm always kind of... Uh, to my own uh, trouble, uh, sometimes actually interested in different perspectives and uh, I would rather not just work with a memory studies expert or a neuroscientist and just go with their opinion, but I'd rather just collect a range of different perspectives when I'm putting together a creative programme and to kind of let those different um, perspectives influence the way that I develop a project, uh, an exhibition, a curated exhibition, you know, or, or let it inform the, uh, a conversation with an artist which actually develops somewhere along the line into a new, uh, new piece of artwork. Um, so, so with this project, I don't think this was the best exhibition that I've ever curated at all. However, the, it was the easiest one for the university to get their head around in terms of the REF um, submission. Um, so we did a group exhibition in the gallery with nine different uh, international contemporary artists. A lot of new work um, around the exhibition thematic. but And then we uh, commissioned a series of interactive touchscreen games in our media lounge. Uh, which we met, uh, used as the kind of first encounter with our audience. So we worked with the Visual Perception Lab at Liverpool University. Um, we created these games which explored things like um, matrix memory and uh, face recognition and um, uh, spatial, spatial awareness and those sorts of things. Uh, and we got people, we were interested in the, basically the, the uh, kind of re-evaluating um, how brains were being wired and behaviours were being directed differently um, a post-digital, you know, native. So the idea that actually everyone's grown up with technology in the new generation, how do they now respond to um, different stimuli and how is that different to our own, the, our digital immigrants? Um, so we captured a lot of data from these online games. We did, we did it online and we did it physical interfaces in the um, media lounge. And the data that we captured was fed back to the um, visual perception lab for them to study and uh, to use towards their sort of future research. 
We also commissioned a um, pretty sort of standards publication, bringing together different perspectives from the memory studies experts and um, different, different uh, the neuro, neuroscientist um, and me and the other curator wrote text and uh, we kind of pulled together everything, all of that kind of thinking in a publication and the exhibition toured. Um, but actually, I mean, that's all great, but it's then you go on to your next exhibition or actually curators often have a break and, you know, while another curator does something and then you come back to it. Um, and so your kind of curatorial research interests kind of fluctuate and things kind of come back in and out of sight for audiences. Most of the time they're not. Uh, and, and you kind of call back on people that you might have known years ago. Anyway, the, um, what's great about um, it, being inside a university and working, creating cultural programs, but being uh, working within a university is that it gives you access um, and surrounds you with academic thought and knowledge, awareness of what other people are doing and interests, um, and makes you approach things in really different terms. So I think this is... Um, this is a much more kind of sustainable and thought through uh, model of practice. And I think that's why it's working really well in places like iShed and Mixed Reality Lab and Culture Lab is because they have that ongoing relationship with the universe, not just a relationship, but it is, it is the academic. It, you know, it's just, it's turning the model inside out in a way. It's like putting the academics in the arts institution and, and working towards outputs that are collaborative and that have mutual benefit for everybody. Where are we? So here we go, back to BOM. So BOM will offer cross-innovation artworks um, commissions. So in the kinds of ways that I was describing, we'll d develop those through hackathons in our lab space. Um, Co-working spaces for artists. So the image on the left is um, one of the spaces that will be used as a kind of co-working bench and table. Um, so kind of moving away from artists, kind of traditional artist studio settings. It's kind of piloting something... Um, just trying to get my head around membership fees because actually co-working is a really successful phenomenon recently for office workers. Um, it's a kind of new concept, I think, in terms of the way that artists work outside of the um, hacker space um, world. That um, uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try that. We're gonna try and you know put artists together and let them brush shoulders with technologists and all kinds of other creative people. We'll have a photography studio, so I've got a mix of... Uh, we're a social enterprise and absolutely don't want to be a charity. Um, I've got two commercial partnerships on board that cover the rent. One of them is um, a photography studio, which is moving into the basement, a commercial photography studio. Um, and the other is a cafe partner. Um, and we'll do a whole range of stuff with Google Hangouts, digital production facilities. Um, we'll have an old-fashioned dark room as well. So it, we offer a whole range of kind of digital and analog production facilities and thinking spaces. <coughs> um, it looks pretty crap at the moment, and it will probably still look a bit crap when it's done because we've got a really um, minimal budget. It's taken about nine months to, of negotiation to... Um, to get £35,000 private investment from um, a company, uh, which is literally half of the, the budget. We've just got my Arts Council funding, which is 30 k so we can kind of kick off the capital project, but it is still going to look pretty raw. This is iBeam, Centre for Art and Technology in New York. Um, so retaining all the kind of breeze block and the brick and all that kind of stuff, the idea is that it's a space where artists and researchers and people can just come together and meet and share ideas and mess up and it doesn't matter if it gets messy. Um, and this is one of the disruptive media that I'm actually exploring <laughs> at the moment, which is a fucking giant roasting machine um, uh, which has its own uh, disruptive uh, impl implications for a building which is eight stories high and needs a flue going all the way to the top of the building. But um, in terms of where the space sits, which is in a business improvement district, there currently isn't a great footfall um, uh, around where the space is. So it, it, it looks here, and if I could get onto Google Street View, I'd show you around. It's opposite an adult cinema, um, which I quite like the idea. It's conveniently situ situated between Legs 11 and Adult World. And so for me, this could be the new Soho of Birmingham. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, if, if you look at the moment, and this was also part of the thinking that at the moment, if you come into Birmingham, um, and Birmingham was important, by the way, because um, probably much the disappointment of Coventry, um, for me, moving down from Liverpool and thinking about a space to put a national artist support programme for digital media, 
um, and photography. I needed to be close to a train station. I needed to be close to the kind of main point that people come into the city. So it's for national audiences as well as kind of local. Um, and so for me, I really wanted to be close to the train station at the moment. As a cultural destination, the city doesn't really work. Actually, Coventry works a lot better than Birmingham at the moment. Um, but uh, you, you come into New Street and you either go 15 minutes to the left to get to Icon or you'd go 15 minutes to the right to get down to where all the other cool stuff is happening in Digbeth. Um, and occasionally you might go to the, li uh, to the library or to the uh, Museum and Art Gallery, but generally you wouldn't. So BOM is trying to be a kind of agent for creative um, uh, regeneration, but also to try and si kind of sit in the middle of everything and help to join things up a bit. And it looks like that. So I've just kind of run away there. Um, but yeah, just kind of in terms of um, the centre and what, what it's trying to do in terms of exploring counter models to sort of traditional um, models of academic learning um, and things uh, like the University of Culture, which have been referred to before, and the University of Excellence, um, and removing barriers between formal and informal learning, access and engagement, and supporting continuous professional development. So this is a way that BOM can... Um, BOM can help because we'll be supporting creative entrepreneurs. I know that's, that word's been used quite a bit today. Um, we'll be doing that through mentoring and support packages and uh, social entrepreneurs network, as well as co-working space, as well as all of the production facilities and commissions and events that we have going on as well. So we'll be doing that as a kind of inside-outside model to, to how we learn in the classroom here um, and how people will continue um, learning after they leave the university um, and so just to kind of end really on um, an image that I think is particularly pertinent in terms of where the West Midlands are as, you know a region that's kind of been built around the car and you really feel that if you come to somewhere like Coventry that the flyover still really dominates the kind of physical flyover and whatever that is um, artist Namjoon Pike's essay media planning for the post-industrial society the 21st century is now only 26 years away um, he presented that paper at the Rockefeller Foundation in 1974, at a time when the West Midlands was also already starting to feel the, um, the disruption of its own car manufacturing ind industry's decline. Pike pictured an altogether different kind of highway, the electronic superhighway. So he, he um, pr you know, proposed the idea of the information um, superhighway. And he foresaw a broadband communication revolution in amazing detail, even at that point, um, with all of the possibilities for instant unifying connectedness that the internet would bring in years to follow. Um, he felt that moving to America um, from... Uh, was it a career? <laughs> um, and actually feeling the kind of disconnect and um, a kind of social chaos and a, a kind of ethnic split, uh, of a cultural kind of split. Uh, and he saw the way that um, potentially new media could be used as a kind of um, connected television between children's living rooms and connect cultures together. Kind of amazing um, vision at that point. And I think maybe... This is kind of something interesting to kind of leave on in terms of thinking where the West Midlands is, because for all of its clumsy accomplishments, I think the region seems particularly well placed to remodel itself as a UK leading centre for creative innovation, um, albeit a different kind of superhighway to the one that um, we have built. Thanks. <laughs>